Good evening, and welcome to Mount Tabor Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia, Wild Bible Study. We are studying 2 Corinthians, and our facilitator this even, evening is Reverend Alden Vaughn. Please be prepared to learn a lot this afternoon. Please take some notes and enjoy this Bible study. Good afternoon. This is all. Tonight, we're going to uh, begin our lesson on 2 Corinthians, the second chapter. And before we look at, uh, begin the second chapter, let's review what it is that we looked at last week. We talked about the city Corinth. Um, and because of its geographical um, situation, when Rome took over that region, they made uh, Corinth their capital city because of where it was situated. Now, this was despite the fact that Athens was the cultural arts and um, hub for that time, but Corinth was now the Big Apple. And also it had a lot of diverse people and different religious and cultures in there. And one of the things we looked at is that the Romans and the Greeks alone had at least 12 major gods and they had, I don't know how many lesser gods. And in the middle of all of these religious and religious factions, there was a relatively new religion composed of the Jews who professed to follow Jesus Christ. And these Jews were the Christians to whom Paul was writing to at the church at Corinth. Scholars say that Paul wrote at least three letters to these people, and some even say he wrote four. Unfortunately, we only have two of these letters which survived, and they are 1st and 2nd Corinthians. As we begin to look and study tonight, we must have a goal, and our goal is to identify the problems which confronted these Corinthian Christians and find out those problems which resemble the ones that we're faced with today. And then we want to explore methods and ways of correcting the problems to help us reach, equip, and send disciples to ensure the spread of the gospel. Let's start our lesson with 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 to start off with. And it reads thusly, I will be reading from the New International Version, which was published 1995. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you, for if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad, but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did so that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would all share my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Paul is explaining to them why he delayed his visit to them. At the end of chapter one, Paul's letter, uh, he was explaining to them why he had changed his plans to meet with the Corinthians. He had told them that he was going to come and see them on his way to Macedonia. And then when he was coming back from Macedonia, he was coming to them again, and that he was going to have them send him on his way to Judea. But that didn't quite happen that way, because Paul made a decision not to go to them. And it was because of another letter that he wrote in the interim. Now, Paul was quite clear that he wasn't one to say one thing and do something else. He emphasized that he did not say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time. But he declares that the reason he didn't come visit them is that he didn't want to see them when they were sad. It appears that Paul had written this letter to them 
And he said, I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Obviously, this letter was something uh, that Paul had to chastise the Corinthians about, and he was doing it out of love. Paul knew that this letter would cause grief and anguish, and he said that if the Corinthians were grieved, then who would be able to make him happy if he was there with them? So he gave them time to get the letter, to be sorrowful about the letter, and then to make amends. Now, as we reflect on our study goal, I encourage us all to reflect on when we had to do something out of love, which would initially hurt someone. Have you ever had to do that? How did you feel when you did it? What did you hope would happen? Have you been, ever been in a situation where the correction you received really stung? Were you hurt and upset to the point where you disregarded what was said? Or did you accept the correction in the manner in which it was given, love? I believe that whether we find ourselves in the position of Paul or the Corinthians, both positions are equally hard and challenging. The second part that we will look at tonight in this chapter is verses 5 through 11, and that is entitled for me, Forgiveness for the Sinner. This is still referencing the letter that Paul wrote. He says, if anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sakes, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. In these verses, Paul emphasizes the need for the church to forgive the offender. He understands that the person who has received the punishment that he has paid his debt. He urges the Corinthians to reaffirm their love for the offender. He doesn't want the person who did wrong to continue to be ostracized by the church and community. Therefore, Paul says, I urge you, I plead with you to reaffirm your love for him. Perhaps that is a message for us today. Perhaps Paul is saying to us that when a person has served their time, when the punishment is over, then we should reaffirm them. Perhaps one way of doing this would be to restore their rights to them, let them vote. You know, the felon box may be gone from the application, but it is still in the interview room. Let us remember Paul's words. The punishment inflicted on him is sufficient. Enough is enough. We should forgive and comfort so that he won't be overwhelmed by excessive grief. Don't make someone sorrowful over and over again when they have committed something that was wrong and paid the punishment. Verse 9. Paul gives another reason for writing to Corinthians about this particular problem. He wanted to know if they would be obedient, but he has already answered this question by acknowledging back in chapter one when he said, 
Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He, meaning Christ, anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit. So of course, the answer is obedience. Perhaps the Corinthians just needed a bit of prodding. Therefore, let us remember that whenever we see disorder, division, and confusion in the church, recognize who is causing it. Because at the end of this, Paul says that Satan is there and that we are not unaware of his schemes. So whenever we see disorder, confusion, division, recognize who is causing it and let us respond in a manner that will be pleasing to God. The next portion of the scripture that we will look at tonight covers Corinthians 2, 12 through 17. Now, this is the second division of this book of Corinthians, which when we look at it, we can see that it is divided into four parts. Um, in verse one and part of chapter two, Paul explains his actions for not visiting the Corinthians. And then it is divided into portions where Paul defends his ministry. He defends the collection of money and then he defends his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. So this second division that goes through roughly um, chapter seven, we will look at two, 12 through 17. And it says, now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. Paul is now sharing with the Corinthians about his missionary journey. And he went to Troas, which is along the coastline, a little up from Ephesus. And he preached there and he said that the Lord opened a door for me. I know that I have heard that saying many times, and I can indeed testify that the Lord has opened doors for us, and he opened that door for Paul. I remember once I heard someone say, the Lord opened a door for me when all I could see was a wall, but, but here again, I, I digress, so, so let, let me get back. Um, Paul, he was doing the work of the Lord in Troas, and he had no peace of mind. He wanted to find Titus. He wanted to know how the Corinthians had responded to the letter that he sent. He was concerned. He was worried. He, he himself said, I found no peace of mind. You know, when you don't have peace of mind, when you're concerned about something and you're wondering about something, it seems to consume you. So Paul was consumed with this worry. Yet, in the midst of his worrying, he found time to praise God. Look at what it says. Verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Let's look at verse 14, because in those few words, a lot of things are happening. Paul is praising God and thanking him. And he also takes the opportunity to use language and words which have a specific meaning for the citizens of Corinth. Remember, our words are important. They are important to help us explain what it is we want to say. And it is also important to use words that other people know and understand. Therefore, when Paul said 
God would always lead us in a triumphal procession. What is he talking about? Well, remember that this was a Roman colony. The Romans had soldiers in the city. There was probably a fort, a garrison, and all of the trappings that went along with their military position. And when the Romans would conquer a nation and people, they would have a procession that they called a triumphal procession. So they would have all of their military leaders and they would be on their chariots and their horses and standing up and just riding and being very, very proud. And then they would have the people that they had conquered in chains marching behind. The people were humiliated, but the Romans felt good about what they did. So the Corinthians were familiar with these parades that were going on. But Paul lets them know that today in this parade, you are the winner because you are the one that is in the triumphal procession because God leads us in this procession. And it's not just any old procession, but it is the one of Christ. So Paul is letting them know that. And then the second half of the verse, he does the same thing again. And this he is uh, working with those who know about all of the di different religious uh, factions and religions that's going on. There was always some group or some cult that was burning incense or making sacrifices. So there was always a smell in the air. It was quite aromatic. Therefore, when Paul tells the Corinthians that they carry the fragrance of Christ, they could relate that to the fragrances that they could smell from these other instances. And then he let them know that this fragrance, it really is the knowledge of Christ and that it's not the same for everybody. For he says that to some, to those who are being saved, it will be the sweet smell of Christ. And to the other, those who are perishing, it will be the smell of death. Those who are perishing are those who do not accept Jesus Christ. Then Paul asked a question, who is equal to such a task? So we can say tonight, who is equal to such a task. Surely we are not equal to that task on our own. But thanks be to God, we can assume that task because he helps us. He has given us the power and he has given us the great commission. So instead of us focusing on our personal insecurities and our I can't do that motifs. Let us focus on serving Christ and what he can do through us. Who is equal to such a task? We are. We are the nobodies who are trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. And chapter seven, verse 17, verse 17 um, reads, Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. So unlike so many, we, Paul is talking about he and the others who are professing Jesus Christ, that they are not peddling the word of God for profit. Remember the context and the culture in where he was preaching. In the city of Corinth, you had many people who followed great philosophers. You had many people who were eloquent of speech, and they would be talking in the forums, in the markets, um, around the temple and everything. And they were speaking in these great glorious words and they were charismatic and the people would just follow them and they made money doing this. But Paul says, we're not peddling the word of God for profit. On the contrary, 
In Christ, we speak before God with sincerity. And the last words of this verse really let us know that Paul was really speaking not only to the Gentile members there in Corinth, but specifically to the Jews, because he said, we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. And this term, men sent from God, refers to the prophets of the Old Testament. The Torah is filled with men sent from God. So as we continue to go forth, let us be people who are sent by God. The memory verse that we would have from this chapter is 215. For we are to God, the aroma of Christ, among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. My prayer is that you have enjoyed our lesson tonight and that you will join us again next week as we look at chapter three of 2 Corinthians. Thank you so much, Pastor. Amen, amen, amen. What, what questions, does anyone have any questions about what you've heard this evening? Any questions on the list? You can unmute yourself if you're calling in. Star six will unmute you. You can ask your question. Great, great lesson. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Pastor, it goes to show when you explain it quite clearly, <laughs> you don't have the answer. You don't have questions. Amen. Amen. Uh, Sister Vaughn, um, I like the, the, the scripture, and when you read it, uh, you emphasize the word we a lot, and I, I can appreciate that. It makes people in, in, you know, include it in the process. Yes. So thank, you, thank you for that we. We're in God, this together. Yes, God's word is inclusive. Yes. And that's an interesting point. I mean, we talk about God's word is inclusive, but so often those of us who use God's word like mm -hmm. to use it exclusively. Mm -hmm. So we're not always in alignment with what God is teaching us in God's word, even though we uh, profess to be. Um, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Enjoy the lesson, Reverend Vaughn. It was excellent. I, I really like tying in that cultural piece of the procession and how that related to, to the scripture. It's always a cultural underpinning that we don't, we're not aware of, you know, when we look at scripture. So thank you for that. Amen. 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 I, I like to say it's amazing how God's word went forward. You know, they, we take for granted on this day, like, you can mail a letter and get there in two or three days, but they had to send messages uh, on camera back, I guess, and all across the desert and could have got robbed and all, but God really went forward. And I tell you, if it's a letter, this is a long letter. You know, people don't read or write letters like this long no more, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But I... I I'm amazed how God, like you say, God's word will fool, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So how might we apply the lesson that we've heard tonight? How might we apply that to our lives, our daily existence? I think one of the, one of the main points that really stands out is forgiveness. And uh, when someone does something to you or you encounter something when it's maybe uh, something atrocious and it stays with you, until you can reach that point of forgiveness, until you can reach that point of forgiveness, you are actually becoming stagnant in God because you won't let go. You're always remembering what happened and you sometimes, uh, I've heard it saying, well, 
she needs to be told, and I'm just the one to do it. <laughs> but you have to let go of those things and move on about your life of forgiveness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. I like the comparison of the, the fragrance and how um, when we encounter people, we need to be that, that sweet smelling fragrance that they want to encounter and want to be around. Um, and everybody you meet doesn't have that free, sweet fragrance about them. And, and there are times that we probably all don't have it. But to, to look at it this way, that God wants us to be that, that sweet aroma for those in need, for those that are in darkness. And um, just looking at it that way is, is kind of a little astounding. Mm -hmm. So we have the opportunity to look beyond ourselves and we have the responsibility, I should say, to look beyond ourselves and what, you know, so that we might be the proper representatives that God has assigned us to be in community. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and for some, that might be as simple as wearing a mask, but I'm not mm -hmm. going there. I'm just saying. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm just saying what I'm saying. <laughs> Same, yeah. Same. Same. Any, any other comments on the lesson tonight? Again, for those who are calling in, you can unmute uh, with star six. Amen. Well, we do thank Reverend Vaughn for uh, the lesson tonight. Again, we're working our way through Second Corinthians, and we encourage you to read that in advance. Uh, go through it so that when she gets there, uh, you will have some understanding of things that uh, she's talking about that helps in our personal development. And so we encourage you to do that. Uh, we don't want to just uh, read it. We don't want to just hear it. We don't just want to say that was a nice lesson, but it, we really want to live it out so that those that come in contact with us will be impacted by our testimonies, our lifestyles, uh, so that they might know who it is that we're connected to, who we're in relationship with. And so we thank Reverend Vaughn for, for this wonderful lesson. And we continue, uh, as we continue to study uh, faithfully God's word, uh, we want to press forward. We don't have a message for tonight. Uh, we will have one next week. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and uh, close out. Just remember, any announcements? We have a, this is a busy weekend coming up. We have a lot, lot yeah. scheduled this weekend. Uh, Sister Hilda, would you want to say a little something about uh, what's well, going on this weekend? Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, we are looking for a marvelous time Saturday. Um, we're going to have the voter registration applications to fill out. We have um, a person from MICA with, at Richmond Hill who's going to assist us with that. And we, we, we are so ready for that. If you're able to come, if you could bring a few um, balloons, that would be uh, appreciative. Also on this Saturday coming up. Uh, Glenda at the well is going to also do a clothes giveaway and she will have her set up on the parking lot. We're going to be on the, on the sidewalks right in front of Mount Tabor for the uh, voter registration. But Glenda will be on this um, parking lot with giving out clothes, household items, and some other goodies. Also, um, Brother Walker and Sister Pam I think are going to supply us with some food boxes also on the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a marvelous day. Amen. And I, my mind is really rapping and rolling, so I'm looking forward to it. Amen. Amen. Reverend John Vaughn, anything else happening on Saturday? Yes, we're having a wonderful men's workshop on Saturday uh -oh. at 2 o'clock. And oh, okay. several men have a volunteer to make uh, presentation from the Uncommon Manhood, and just looking forward to that. Then that Sunday is going to be followed up with Men's Day. Uh, preaching will be done by Reverend Joseph Waddy, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Joseph Waddy, yeah. And we also have participants from men's ministry on their program. So we're just looking forward to a high time in the Lord. Amen, amen, amen. So we will be at Mount Tabor on Saturday from 11 to 1. Some persons have already volunteered. That's out on the uh, sidewalk. We will not be in the building. Others will be on the parking lot. And then virtually we'll have a men's workshop. Uh, the codes are out and available. And so we are just grateful for what God is continuing to do in the life of the church. And then we'll celebrate on Sunday, Men's Day. 
and we'll also have some pictures up on what happened on Saturday. So again, we're thankful for all that is taking place in the life of the church. The building may be closed, but the work continues. I'm grateful for each person's participation in the work. Amen. Amen. Reverend Alden Vaughn, would you uh, close us out in prayer? Yes, I will. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to you now thanking you for this time that you have afforded us to study your word together. Lord, we pray that what we have studied tonight, that it will be able to sink into our hearts and our spirits so that we can better serve your people by serving you. Now, God, as we continue here at Mount Tabor Baptist Church with all of the things that we have coming up, we want to thank you for the vision and the visionaries. We want to thank you, Lord, for those who are putting their hands to the plow and not looking back. Thank you, Lord, for how you are going to continue to use us. Let us continue to be the sweet fragrance of Christ okay. to those in the world. Yes. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.